Our first question here, good morning, Shannon and Dr. Doreen. How do we teach our older kids to recognize they the, the need for help? My 14-year-old is sound sensitive and I didn't realize how much it impacts him. My husband was using the hair dryer and I happened to walk into his room to ask him about breakfast. He was covering his ears and curled up in fear. Before we assumed he was taking his time getting ready in the morning. Now we realize it's the hair dryer that causes him to freeze. Last night he woke up from thunder and was stressed about hearing more and thank you for any ideas and thanks for taking my convoluted question. Not convoluted at no, all. That's a great question. And I'm wondering if you live near me because we had thunder that was so loud last Scary. night. It woke me up. Yeah. I, and I thought, what what on earth was that? Because yeah. uh, we don't get a lot of thunder no, here. We don't. Um, so but no, it that's was a great loud. question. That's a very good question, and there's a very easy solution to this. So uh, buy him some noise canceling headphones, first of all and uh, just begin, uh, and I don't, did they say if the child is verbal or nonverbal? Um, they didn't say. Right, so uh, to me, verbal and nonverbal doesn't really matter. The, the idea of verbalizing is pretty much the same as touching an icon. So uh, what I would do though is you, you first start with, every time that a, new, a noise is about to happen, let's say the hair dryer, which is a very good example because it's on a set schedule that happens, let's say every morning, uh, prior to that, you simply go over to the child and just have him repeat headphones and put the headphones on him and then go ahead and do the hair dryer. And that in itself will be rewarding because this is he, it allows him to avoid the noise. So it'll become something that very quickly he'll understand is a good thing. Um, and that's it. And then from there, he will begin to do it himself. He will begin to put the headphones on himself because it's so rewarding. And then if you want, you can also, you know, if you say the label every time, then he'll understand what it is. And then you will gradually fade out just by saying head, and then he'll say headphones. Then you'll just say, and then he'll say headphones. You shape out your, your prompting, uh, fade out your prompting, and then he'll be asking for headphones. And um, if he doesn't like headphones in the beginning, if they're kind of freaky to him, then you do that as a shaping procedure. So you just put it on him for one second, and you reward him and you put it on two seconds and you reward him. But I'm pretty sure that he'll find it very rewarding, yeah. because especially when he sees that you're turning on the uh, hair dryer and he has to be able to see it, but it doesn't bother him, he'll be very, very happy. And then it'll generalize. You'll teach him to use it in other circumstances, like another good example of something is a vacuum. A lot of kids are afraid of the vacuum sound or flushing. There's another one that kids don't like. There's a lot of things like that and you can just teach him each time, uh, it's just modeling and okay. he will do it. And I love that answer, but, I, but I'm wondering about the bigger question about, there mm -hmm. are so many, I've had this happen with Jem sometimes that I find out after the fact, mm -hmm. something that was bothering him, but he didn't know, he didn't feel empowered enough or he didn't realize that it could be changed if he would just let me know. Mm -hmm. How do we help our kids to speak up and say, this is really bothersome to me before it's the point where they're on the floor covering their ears? Right. So there's, uh, you're coming at it from the perspective of the mom of Jem, who is a child who's at the, at the, uh, has the capability to actually address it that way. Okay. Most of our kids aren't there yet. They're mm -hmm. not quite at the point where they can actually identify all the things that bother them and then vocalize that they bother them. That's essentially what you want him to do. Is, yeah. All right, so do that. Have him list, start a yeah. list, okay. which is these are the things that I don't like, right, okay. that bother me, and why. Also, like they're too loud or it's too bright or whatever it is, so a list of items. And then solutions, so have him write out. Like, you know, noises bother me because they're too loud and I can ask mom for help or I can put on my headphones okay. or I can go to another room or stuff like that. So uh, you're... What you're doing is you're organizing what's in his head already okay. uh, and you're empowering him by adding yourself as a solution. Okay. Right? Most of the time, actually, a lot of kids, especially our kids, Shannon, because they're so used to A, tolerating, because yeah. the world is not, a, not perfect for them. Yeah. So 
they're used to tolerating and secondly they're used to using negative beha challenging behaviors in order to get their needs met because normally uh, either they don't have the ability to ask for help or when they have in the past nobody understood why or didn't get it so now they have to kind of act out to get someone's attention so it's very it, it's a it's kind of contraindicated it doesn't make sense to them that I can ask for help and they'll help me you know absolutely but I mean it's such a you I should wouldn't worry about it because as long as you just keep reminding them that okay uh, you know, you can ask for help, you know, like, or you can ask me to change that. Or what are some, let's sit down and talk about it. What are some things that we could do to make this yeah. different? And I will say we did, we get to that eventually, but it's always after right. he's been miserable for a while. Right. But maybe I just need to hang a form somewhere on the wall that's like gems, concerns, where he can write it down whenever he wants to and remind him that. Well, the other problem could be, and you have to realize this is very typical to all kids, is that they don't recognize that they've been miserable for a while. That's it. So it's not necessarily <laughs> it's not that just, once I'm miserable, I know I can go to mom for help, but right. they're busy doing something else. And it's kind of like, it's just, it's a gradual increase yeah. of their tolerance level. So they don't, it's not like a, you're not going from light to dark. Okay. You know what I mean? It's a gradual process, kind of like weight gain yeah. so if you're gaining weight you gradually your tight your clothes get tighter and tighter gradually until they get uncomfortable yeah right That's so it's true. not like you become aware that oh i've gained weight all okay. of a sudden so that with the kids it's more and that is self-regulation so they're okay. not quite aware of their happiness level so if that's it then what you need to do is at random times just okay. ask, are you, can you tell me about yourself right now? How do you feel in the environment? You know, this is like a big problem for our kids. Uh -huh. They, a lot of our kids just walk over stuff. They don't, yeah. or on top of things, knock into things, you know, yeah. they're not aware of their own body and space. So it's kind of like, how do you feel right now? And give them like five checkpoints, you know? sleepiness level or tiredness level yeah rate it you know yeah. happy face medium or sad face, whatever how's your and teach him to self-regulate like okay I, i'm i don't have any i don't feel sleepy i don't have any pain that would be another right. one that's very important uh perhaps like sensory stuff like noises bothering you or something like that um, anxiety would be another really good one. Are you worried about anything, you know? Yeah. So like five right. checkpoints, like these are the things and ask him like twice a day, three times a day and have him rate it. And I promise you, and if you do it for a week, he'll start just doing it himself. He'll okay. start checking it I on himself. I love this. That's yeah. great. It's good for us. I too. can already see uh, a checklist. Maybe we'll make a checklist and have that available on the website in uh, January. So we had several questions, as I mentioned, come in in the last week. Uh, three different parents writing in. This one in particular said, my son is 12 and in the sixth grade. He started with CARD end of August 2014. Mm -hmm. I love learning from Ask Dr. Doreen. One repeating strong advice from Shannon and Dr. Grampiche is to use skills. But for CARD clients, we aren't granted access to the full version, only a very restricted one. Why is that? When we can learn and be more knowledgeable partners with CARD to help our kids. Right. I... Um I know of one restriction that's placed. Uh, see, for CARD clients, we, our system is that all of the data, is, we're assured, let's put it this way, we are assured that there's ad, um, accurate and complete data collection. So uh, what happens is all of our staff goes through this process of training where on their iPad, they're inputting data. And as they input the data, that the iPad collects all of that data and throws it into skills right away so that it's live essentially so that at any given time a supervisor can look at your skills data and it's not something that someone else has gone in and put in by hand so now that because there's a lot of you know that's not actual valid data right if someone if what we used to do before we had this capacity and what what others do is that they would they do paper and pencil data and then they summarize it so you know that's fine and then you put the data you have to actually manually enter the data into skills right so the, the acquisition and and all of that so this is you know it took 10 trials on this day and so on and so forth. and that's a lot of work and it sometimes is not as accurate obviously um, so 
we set up this whole system where it would allow the data to enter live, right? So that when someone's putting in the trials, um, it goes straight in. And right now we've ruled out the DCT and NAT um, formats of data collection. So because of that, we can't give parents access to the data collection portion because we can't allow that to be changed and it's not non-modifiable if any if someone like if i enter data at a session and then a supervisor goes in and modifies it later it's it's uh, it's kind of um wrong right it's, it's like falsifying it's it. falsifying it you don't want to touch the data once it's been entered right. because it's real data it right. is what happened so data, once it's entered, can't be touched. It can't be touched by parents or anyone else, actually. And the reason that happens with CARD clients is that CARD is the only organization that uses the iPad, the whole system we've built. We've built a huge system, which I think will go public pretty soon and we'll send it out to everyone. But it's a really awesome uh, yeah. system of data collection. Now, um, other aspects as well. Now, so there's other things, for instance, I just thought of. Let's say um, I, okay, so I, now I'm thinking of several different reasons. But One, So for instance, let's say uh, medication entry, like that's very, it's, it's extremely important to us that we collect historic records on right. medication. And so uh, someone will input the, what the medication is or dietary or whatever it is, if, if change access occurs so if a parent can go in and change something right it's going to cause problems because uh what you know the multidisciplinary timeline shows duration of time like so it'll yeah. show from here to here the child was doing this and from here to here and so on right um, and that's true of pretty much anything so i can't imagine why you don't have read-only access you should have read-only access to the whole thing in other words parents should be able to view everything yeah but just not change it that's the only and, thing and here's the empowering thing about that for me is that if you want to um the old way that it used to be done was to take the data on paper if you want to take data on paper as a parent you mm -hmm. can still do that and, yeah and i don't think I don't, I don't know many parents that are like, oh, I yeah, want to take data. Yeah, and I don't think that's, I, I'm not sure, actually, when, when Shannon read me the question, I quickly, on the last break, sent an email to the director of skills, Eliana, and asked, what's the limited access that parents have? Because I don't want you to have limited access. We'd very much like you to learn from skills and see the yeah. whole thing. Um, I think the portion that we have to maintain limited is the, uh, is the modification, like being able to modify something that's already input, including programming. Yeah. Now, here's another thing that I think is actually, it's pretty valid. I would, I, I will make sure you have access to everything else. I know one of the things that th uh, supervisors have complained about okay. to me is that if you, if parents go in and see um, all of skills, like all the possible things, they will keep coming back and saying, I want to go to this program. I want to go to right. that program. Why aren't you teaching this? And it ends up taking a ton of time just to explain to them that right. we are in the right place right now. We will gradually get there and right. so on and so forth. But from my perspective, I like empowering parents and yeah. I like the discussion and debate because obviously parents are the owners of the child and they are the ones that get to, to say, have yes. a say about it. And I like the fact that it forces my supervisors to actually justify what they're doing. Exactly. So, you know, from my perspective, it, it's, a, <laughs> it's a dialogue moment. And I think when I, when I, I've never, ever uh, put in a program that the parent didn't agree with. Right. Ever. In, right. in 30 years, ever. Yeah. So I feel like it's always a, a, a kind of a decision that you make together yeah. in terms of what's most important and where do we want to go. So yeah. I'll look into that and okay. I'll make sure that we um, give access to everything except data. Um, do keep in mind that when we do these changes to skills, it's quite a process and there's like a big wait list right now of changes that need to be made. 
So it might take a little bit of time, but okay. not too long. Okay, great. Uh, next question. I was hoping we could get a fence in our yard to make it easier to keep my child, children, safe at the same time because my child will wander and I have to leave my three-year-old standing on her own to retrieve my six-year-old son. Mm -hmm. My hu husband doesn't want a fence for several reasons. My son has a GPS watch, but what can I do to get him fresh air with his sister and keep them both safe? Any creative ideas? He has autism with significant ADHD and <clears throat> ODD behavior. And we, and we don't know what the reasons are for dad not wanting a fence. Right. Uh, but we right. did just mention that act today, if one of them is that you don't want to invest in a fence because you're leaving, and uh, but you need the fence right now, there is a, a special part of act today that's called SOS, uh, which you can apply for a grant any time of year when it's a safety and when it's a life and death issue. And fences are included in that. Absolutely. And they will, and they uh, will help you to be able to get the fence. Yeah, we do fencing a lot. So it's one of our big things, actually. We have found fencing contractors even all over the country. But yeah, yeah I, I do support that very much. I'm, I mean, putting in a fence is such an easy solution to it so that I'm not sure I can think of, I mean, you know, a fence is probably serves the function just the same as, I don't know what these things are called, they're, um, they're like a, a vest that the, I've seen young children wear, just typically developing children, and it kind of has a, a leash on it, yeah. you know, and it expands. So like you yeah. can go about 20 feet <clears throat> and it'll retract and stuff, and I think that's for safety as well, so yeah. the parent can manage multiple children. Um, that would work, but it's a little bit harder than a fence because it kind of gets tangled if you go too far. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not, you know, and obviously, ultimately, if you have a BCBA working with you, the, the goal is to teach your child not to run away and yeah. teach your child safety. But that's not something that you can do in, in a moment. It's a number of different steps which help the child identify what's dangerous and become somewhat fearful of what's dangerous. So that's not a quick fix. Um, <clears throat> short of that, I mean, those are the only ideas I can really give right now. Even they even have the um, they have harnesses that are yes. made in different uh, characters. At one point, Jem, when he was really little, had a Winnie the Pooh harness that had the leash, and then later on, he had um, like a Star Wars one. They had like a Yoda one, I think he had. Absolutely. Um, and he still, I mean, he had one of those until like when we would go to Disneyland or something like that because we're both older parents and my ability to run after him, and the child would just run. Yeah. Um, but once we were working with therapists, that very quickly went away, and right. the harness got to go away right but you've got to but prioritize it, safety over everything else including what your husband feels about yes. like aesthetically what a fence look, like we don't know what the husband's obje objections to the fence are but if it's mostly monetary apply for a grant yes um, and if it's other things that are cosmetic and whatever you know, you have to prioritize your child's safety while you work on these Absolutely things. Absolutely agree. It's got to be the priority. I What I don't want is for you to send me back an email sometime in the future and you say to me, I wish I had taken this more seriously. Every week we get notifications here at Autism Live of individuals of all ages on the autism spectrum who are missing. And we know that over 50% of our kids will elope. Uh, they've done studies on that. And, you know, the statistics of who comes back okay is devastating yeah. so this is yeah. as serious as a heart attack mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't mean to you know wreck your day but make this your priority to, yeah. to make sure that you are as safe as you can possibly be especially when you've got a little one if you're having to choose I mean for me that's Sophie's choice running away from one small child to run after your other child you know I can't imagine anything worse it's very difficult and I'm, my initial concern was uh, just hearing your email like how are you coping like yeah. that must be a really difficult situation for you and uh, so an offense is such a fast and, and easy solution yeah it's not the be all end all you still got to be working on stuff but Absolutely. at least it puts it puts something there in place that will help you right. get your kids out get them fresh air and get them in the sunshine and not be in constant worry having that pit in the bottom of your stomach that's right so um, anyway I'm gonna move on to this next question which I find really interesting dr. Doreen does card incorporate pivotal response therapy into children's programs when appropriate if yes how and when is it most 
most appropriate? And if not, why? Thank you for all your help week after week. And a big thanks to Shannon. I thank you for being here and asking that question. I love it. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'll be honest. I don't think we really incorporate the concepts of pivotal, pivotal response therapy. Um, you know, pivotal response uh, uh, is based on the premise that you will, um, you teach specific skills that are pivotal um, in terms of developing other skills. So for instance, uh, I would, you know, I, I don't know, I would teach you, let's say the skill of um, eye contact and then hope that that will lead to several different things. Or I will teach you the skill uh, of something, and pivotal skills, by the way, alter by environmental factors. So in, in given, in different settings, a skill can be pivotal or not. But regardless, they're the sort of key skills or the important skills that lead to other things. You know, the, the only reason I would say that we don't really go with that concept is that we teach pretty much every skill um, unless we see the child developing it naturally. So it's, we're not selectively saying um, these are the skills that are pivotal in this situation. I don't have to teach anything beyond that. We kind of go ahead and teach the other skills. Uh, we even really work on, intensely work on generalization. You know, in, P in PRT, you don't do a lot of generalization work because the assumption is that generalization really occurs by itself because you've taught the pivotal skills. Um, you know, we do a lot of generalization work. We actually alter the people, we alter the setting, we alter the stimuli, we alter things so that the child, we, we teach every concept in four or five different ways. And the way that we do that, the reason we do that is so that the child, the, the skill generalizes. Now skills generalize, um, you can change the stimulus, so for instance the setting, the person teaching, or the environment, and that's leads to what's called stimulus generalization. That means the child will learn to do the same behavior with different stimuli, with different people in different settings, different times, and so on. But what you're hoping for is response generalization, is that you want the child, when they learn, um, let's say this is yellow, you know, um, then they also know that this is yellow. So it generalizes from one thing, but or they will know response generalization is if I want someone to give me something, they'll give it to me, but they'll also learn to point to it. The behavior actually changes. And so we work on those concepts. We don't depend on teaching a pivotal uh, skill to generalize automatically. So that's the only reason. We just go ahead and teach it. My reason, the reason for that, that we do it this way is because I don't think that, um, I, I just think it's more effective this way. I don't want to say anything against PRT. I think PRT is a very uh, smart and genius discovery and, and um, I have a lot of respect for the Kegels who came up with this process. But uh, from my perspective, I, I don't, it takes too much time. I see all of my kids very, very differently. Mm -hmm. And it takes too much time to want to identify pivotal skills for each child and what I can and cannot teach. So I might as well just start teaching. And as soon as I see the child picks it up, I'll move past it. But it's just faster for our kids. And hey, it's a refresher. If they know it, I'll just yeah. move on. I will say from a parent's perspective that I think um, that all the things that you're wanting to get from pivotal response training, you get that and much more. Right. You get a lot more. You just do a uh, lot more. PRT yeah. is That's not... That's my experience. Right. I'm going to uh, move right along. Uh, my three-year-old girl was recently diagnosed with high-functioning autism and sensory processing disorder and expressive language disorder. We have Medicaid, but want to know our options as far as how to help her get in with CARD. I actually do ABA with a family that uses card services and, and have been with them for six years. I've always enjoyed the training and uh, workshops, but now that it pertains to my own daughter, I'm mm. lost. Uh, she's very aggressive and lashes out, but it's mainly due to sensory overload. What are the best things we can do for her until we are able to get ABA services? And they said, thanks. I love uh, the show and you, Dr. Grant Pichet. Mm, that's wonderful. Thank you. What were the diagnoses? Sensory processing? High-functioning autism. Sensory, I, I you. Okay. Uh, sensory processing disorder and expressive language disorder. Right, right. So you should be able to get funding right now, right it's away. Medicaid. Yeah, you still, you should be able to get funding. But right I now. don't think it's California. 
Oh, uh, I don't. Yes, of course, that has to do with where you are, obviously. Uh, I because I feel like uh, please, if you're if you're still watching, write and tell us which state you're in. But I feel like we had a question from the, these circumstances before, and I I'm I'm feeling it's Virginia or possibly West Virginia. But so right. Right Virginia has funding, and okay. I don't know about West Virginia. So what I would do is, uh, and instead of telling us, because I'm not sure we would even know which states at this okay. point, but uh, you can always contact our, um, well, there's two departments here that you can contact. One is our public policy department, um, Julie Kornack, who can give you a lot of information about Medicaid, and another one is our contracts department, Bryce Myler yeah. at CARD. Both of those are Center for Autism um, server uh, URLs, and you can uh, go on our website and access those departments, and they can give you a lot more information about uh, funding. Um, you are eligible, your child is eligible, obviously, if they have an autism yeah. diagnosis, they're eligible for these services, and I think you should get the services right away. Yeah. Um, it is uh, very common, I think, that kids develop aggressive behaviors because they have sensory overload. Yeah. And um, from a behavioral perspective, there's always two things you can do. You can always um, do antecedent modifications or consequence modifications. So the antecedent modifications in this case would be very important, and those are modify things in the environment that are that produce the sensory uh, overload or sensory harshness to the child. So for instance, don't use lights that are very harsh. Uh, you know, have, have mild yellow lighting in each room. Um, try to avoid noises that are, that are uh, um, extremely har harsh on the child. Uh, try to give the child uh, things that they can use to prevent, you know, to protect themselves from those environmental stimuli as we talked, um, like uh, noise canceling headphones or those types of things. Um, other, there's a lot you can do from a sensory perspective. You should probably consult with a occupational therapist who has sensory integration training, but we've learned over the years there's a million different things. I mean, from children have different needs. There are certain ser sensory exercises and activities you do that can calm a child, and there are some that can increase the activity level of the child. So. You have to sort of, uh, it's very specific for each child. Um, some of the kids don't have sensory overload, they have a sensory need. So they, they sort of have needs of, you know, uh, needing pressure on their skin or needing to be held very tightly or those types of things. Or even brushing helps calm some of our ch children. So that's the antecedent modifications. In terms of the consequence modifications, obviously you have to identify why the aggression is occurring, what is the child trying to achieve or accomplish, and then you have to make sure that they don't accomplish that, but that they request in a much appropriate, better way. Aggression is always frustration or trying to communicate something. So it could be pain, it could be frustration, it could be these noises are too loud, you know, whatever it is, or it could be ac wanting access to something. But it's, it's a learned form of communication. The child is trying to communicate something, figure out what it is the child is trying to communicate, teach them a better way, and then give them the object that they're wanting or allow them, reinforce them for that. But I mean, that's a very short way of uh, answering you. And um, when you have a child who's already aggressive, it's important to get professional help because yeah. uh, it, can, it can become harmful and it can get worse. But, uh, you know, and uh, one resource for you, because it sounded like you have familiarity with some of our programs through... Yeah work you have done with other kids? She's in West sure. Virginia, and so I think she works with a family who is getting remote uh, services. Right, right. Uh, uh, so uh, so I, you're what we would call a workshop therapist. So what I would suggest you do is you, you should get on the IBT website, Institute for Behavioral Training. Um, so go to ibehavioraltraining.com. Right, ibehavioraltraining.com. Very important to go there. Uh, just go straight to modules that talk about aggression and how to control challenging behaviors and also sensory issues and so on. Find the modules that apply to you or that you would like to learn more about. Um, get on there and learn those because those are the techniques. Um, our book would be possibly very useful to you. Um, Evidence-based treatments for children with autism. Um, the CARD model. Um, and then I think on top of that, of course, um, you know, if you have the ability, it's hard when you're doing it for your own child, but I mean, if you have the ability, set up an actual program and have 
um, therapists and other people try to come in and help. I, in the past, when there was no insurance funding, you know, I would have families in remote, remote areas, and what they would do is just get their neighbors and everyone from town would put in two hours here and there, yeah. and I swear it helped. I mean, yeah. it really does help. Absolutely. So. And so I, you know, all of that, I'm going to condense that down for you and say, you, I would advise you to call the 800 number for CARD, which you can find on centerforautism.com, and tell them where you are and what your services are. They'll hook you up with Bryce to see what funding you have available to That's do that. That's a great idea. But, and, and then go to ibehavioraltraining.com. I don't know that they're a therapist for this family. I think they're working in a different capacity for the family, maybe, maybe babysitting or something like that. So I want to encourage you to go to ibehavioraltraining.com and there's that whole RBT training. You could start that, get become a registered behavior therapist to be able to help your child and other, other families as well um, while you're getting ready to do all this. And then, and then at some point when you get all that in place, you're going to want to sign up to get at least the first 14 day free trial of skills to take a look there to see some lessons. You got a lot of work ahead of you, you but do. it sounds like you're the right person um, and that your child is very lucky to have you and that you have this family that you have a relationship with that, that can also tell you how much hope there is. And, and connect with the whoever the supervisor of the case is where you've seen our programs yeah. because they can also try to guide you and get you through to us. Absolutely. And keep in touch with us. And, and she did write and say she was in West Virginia. I want to I want to just say for a second how scary it is that I don't even I know. know you, but I could figure out from the email your voice is very particular. And I can't remember my own personal zip code, but I knew that you were in Virginia or West Virginia. That frightens me. That's uh, so strange. <laughs> it's very that. strange. My mind only pays attention to things it wants yeah. to pay attention to. Uh, but you're on my radar. And uh, so that's a wonderful thing. We'll hold hands. We'll get, we'll get through this together, right? Uh, okay. So uh want to go to uh, hi ladies can we teach our kids sympathy my son laughs when his siblings cry yes oh gosh that's such a big issue actually um, it, it it's it's a lar it's an, it's not as easy as as it's as you as you would imagine it's not one concept alone um, sympathy if you kind of break it down and analyze what it is it comes from the concept of um, oh God, it's a very complicated concept. It depends on numerous things. So for instance, if you see someone crying, a typical person would look at the person crying and think, oh, first of all, they'd have to have the skill of recognizing that crying means they are hurt or in pain or upset or sad. Okay. Then you have to be able to uh, connect with that emotion enough to feel what it is. And realistically, the reason human beings show sympathy is because they fear feeling it themselves. So it's, it's an instance where we put ourselves in someone else's shoes and then, uh, you know, it, it makes us fearful because we momentarily understand and feel how they're feeling. And so in order to be able to do that, the number one skill you have to have, which a lot of our kids are lacking, is theory of mind, perspective taking. You have to be able to take someone else's perspective in order to understand and give sympathy. So that then says that you have to teach the child uh, perspective taking. And that is a whole curriculum. So, you know, if I, to guide you, um, if you get on skills, and because there's just way too many for me to list here, but if you get on skills for autism.com um, and go to the curriculum that's called cognitive curriculum, that's the section you want to be in, the vast majority of the lessons in the cognitive curriculum teach perspective taking because perspective taking is more than just understanding how someone feels. It's also understanding things like what they're thinking and why are they thinking those things and how are they interpreting things and um, you know when someone feels a certain way is it common or is it unusual for that person and where does it fit in with the rest of their there's a lot in terms of perspective taking so we've broken it down into developmentally more and more advanced ways of teaching perspective taking and that's what's available on that curriculum cognitive cognition 
Um, so I would really start teaching some the most, I mean, skills asks you, can your child do this? Can your child do this? And so on. So you'll answer yes or no. And then you start with the most basic and then you'll build up from there. And don't, you know, in the meantime, obviously you want to make sure your child knows that it's, it's um, more hurtful uh, to the siblings um, when he laughs at them. Like laughing at someone is, is not very good. Like in other words, you want your child to know it's not a good behavior, laughing at someone when they're crying. But it's not going to make a whole lot of sense to the child until you teach them perspective taking. Okay. And I'm going to squeeze one question, but we only sure. have 30 seconds. My son is seven and has autism and came home with a broken collarbone. Oh my God. The teacher said he was sitting on a ball in the class and that he fell off. I think they're covering something up. Should I file a lawsuit? Uh, oh my goodness. That's a tough one. I can't answer that. I, and I don't know a collar br breaking a collarbone is not that easy. It's not like you can actually fall off of a ball and I'm not sure what he would have landed on. If, if anything, I would at least talk with a physician who uh, is taking care of him and say, what possible, is it possible right. to fall off of a ball and break your collarbone? And then I would probably ask a lot of questions yeah. because then I think that you will be able to tell um, just from the reaction you get whether there's more to investigate or not. Um, if you have suspicions, certainly go ahead and, uh, you know, tell the school and, and have an investigation yeah. done. Uh, but I try to always have a more positive view on things yeah. and hope that those people who are in school and involved with special education have better intentions and more yeah. positive motives. Um, but, you know, they also may have a lot of fear and yeah. accidents do happen, but it's it's pretty sad. And I, and I just like we said at the beginning of the show, I think the priority has got to be find out if your child is safe. Find out if your child is safe and uh, do frequent, if you can, do frequent 20-minute observations, which they are legally not, they can't prevent you from doing that. Yeah. You don't have to let them know ahead of time. You can drop in. And, or uh, if you really are suspicious, there's a lot of uh, items now, for instance, a uh, pen that has a hidden camera in yeah. it, and you can just put it in your child's backpack. There's a lot of different hidden cameras, uh, items yeah. that you can... Uh, put with your child so that if you don't see, you can at least hear what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. But ensure that your child is safe and that nothing untoward is happening and that they're going to be okay. I think that's the first order of business.